Well, congregation, our scripture passage that we're going to be turning to uh, to kick off the sermon uh, on the whole book of Deuteronomy is uh, Deuteronomy 10, Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 12 through 22. You can find that in most of the Pew Bibles on page 182. This, of course, is uh, as we come to the book of Deuteronomy in this series where we're going to preach one sermon, sermon on every book of the Bible so we become more familiar with the content of Scripture. This evening we're looking at Moses' last book, uh, Deuteronomy, the last address he has to the second generation. We're only going to be reading the first passage. I know that the, the bulletin has two. At the last minute I changed my mind. We're going to be looking at a few other passages throughout the sermon. So for the sake of time, we're just going to read Deuteronomy 10 at this time. People of God, let's give our attention now to the hearing of God's holy word. Deuteronomy 10, beginning at verse 12. And now, O Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all His ways, to love Him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and to observe the Lord's commands and decrees that I am giving you today for your own good. To the Lord your God belongs the heavens, even the highest heavens, the earth and everything in it. Yet the Lord set his affection on your forefathers and loved them. And he chose you, their descendants, above all the nations as it is today. Circumcise your hearts, therefore, and do not be stiff-necked any longer. For the Lord your God is God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. He defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow, and loves the alien, giving him food and clothing. And you are to love those who are aliens, for you yourselves were aliens in Egypt. Fear the Lord your God and serve Him. Hold fast to Him and take your oaths in His name. He is your praise. He is your God, who performed for you those great and awesome wonders you saw with your own eyes. Your forefathers who went down to Egypt were 70 in all, and now the Lord your God has made you as numerous as the stars in the sky. And there ends the reading of God's holy word this evening. And uh, before we begin looking at the book of Deuteronomy, as always, let's pause for a moment of prayer, asking that the Spirit would bless our study this evening. Our great and awesome God, indeed, you are the God of all gods. You are the Lord of all lords, and Father, as we come to close out your Lord's Day, as we assemble once again, we pray that you would meet with us now. We ask, O Lord, that you'd bless us with the presence of your Spirit, that he would bless these moments that we study together, that they would bear fruit in our hearts and our lives. We pray, Lord, that you would give us an understanding of your Word. And uh, Father, we pray, use your Word now to give us a greater understanding, a clearer picture of the love of our Savior, that he would be glorified in the hearing of this Word. We ask this in Christ's name alone. Amen. Well, when I was in college, uh, there were a number of teachers who would uh, have study groups before you took an exam. If you've been to college before, perhaps you're in college, maybe your teacher does the same. And I had a few teachers who would do this before a final exam or before a midterm exam, whatever the case may be. He or she would have a student leader hold a study class, and uh, you would go to this class, and the, the whole point of it was to prepare you for that exam. Uh, The student teacher would have kind of a basic outline, a structure, and the goal was to really, in many ways, remind you. It had been many months, perhaps, before we, uh, of uh, many months of review, and so we we would go to these classes in order to have our memories stirred with the things we perhaps already had forgotten. And uh, we also went, at least I went, because it hopefully would give me a clue as to what the teacher's thoughts were, what the content he or she would focus on, so when I sat down to take that exam, Uh, hopefully I would have a better understanding of what was required of me. Well, this evening, as we come to think on the book of Deuteronomy, I think it's a helpful analogy for the function of the book. God is uh, telling Moses to give these final words to his people. He has wandered with them for 40 years. He's dealt with a rebellion. He has dealt with God's grace and mercy. And now they stand on the banks of the Jordan River, ready to cross over. And these are the last words that Moses has from God himself to prepare that generation to enter in. In many ways, it's like a final study preparation. 
Moses, like a student helper, is preparing God's people for, as it were, their final exam. Preparing them to take over the land, to obey God, to not forget all that God had promised them to do. And what we didn't read, you can read that in your own time, but Moses does die at the end of this book. As it closes out, he goes to the top of a mountain. God gives him grace by giving him uh, sight to see all the promised land, despite the fact that he's not allowed to take one step in it. And then God takes his life. Moses is buried by God himself, and that ends this long section of Moses' care over Israel as God's people. But the book of Deuteronomy is God's final word through Moses to prepare that generation. And uh, in the book, you'll find numerous blessings and numerous warnings. Moses is holding up the covenant relationship, saying, if you fail, if you neglect to be faithful, God will bring covenant curse on you. But if you are faithful, God will bless you beyond your wildest imagination. So remember God's promises. And in many ways, that is what the theme that I want to present to you this evening. We learn that the book of Deuteronomy teaches that it reminds God's people to live faithfully in relationship with Him. You kind of boil it all down. Really, if you really want to boil it down to one word, relationship. Deuteronomy is about relationship. It is about God reminding His people to live faithfully in relationship with Him. And as always in your bulletin, you should have a sheet of paper with a four outline that we're using for every book of the Bible. Uh, context, content, church, and then Christ, so we'd have a better understanding of this book. So let's take those in turn. First of all, what is the context of Deuteronomy? And the first thing, as I've said for the last four sermons, is the same tonight. It is Moses. Uh, Moses is the author of this book. This is the last of the five books known as the Pentateuch uh, that God gave to Moses in the wilderness wandering years uh, to give to that generation. Uh, just as an interesting note, obviously Moses did not write all of it. The final part of the book it could not have been written by him because he, of course, died. Very likely Joshua wrote that. We're going to see that next time we do this in the book of Joshua. Uh, there's uh, an appendix added from someone else that was a common way to write these books. Uh, so Moses did not, of course, write his own death, likely Joshua did. But the rest of it is all from Moses. And really the tone, if you read Deuteronomy this week or read it in the past, the tone is really of a, really a final farewell of someone who loves the people. It is a tone of urgency as Moses has these final words. It's almost like he grabs Israel by the collar and he says, Pay attention, Israel. I know you have a tendency to wander. I, I've wandered with your parents. I know your parents' tendency to disobey. Look me in the eye now as I give these last words because I'm about to die on a mountain and you need to remember this before you cross over. It is Moses' last words, a final farewell to the nation of Israel. The title of the book, as I mentioned this morning, simply means second law. Dudo to nomos law. It is the second giving of the law, kind of framed by way of reminder and applied to the second generation. Now, one thing I want to note about the context here is the function of the book. As I said, it's really about relationship. If there's one word, it is relationship. And the function of Deuteronomy is really covenant renewal. Deuteronomy is all about a covenant renewal ceremony where God comes to Israel and He says, you are my people. I am in a relationship with you. We're going to renew our vows. Uh, perhaps you know someone who's uh, been married for many years. We, we hear of older couples do this often. They'll have a covenant renewal ceremony. They'll stand before uh, a minister and they'll repeat their vows and and they do this as a renewal. This is what we committed to so long ago, and this is what we will stand on in the final years of our marriage. Deuteronomy is like that with God. God says, we're going to renew our vows with one another. We're in a relationship, and Deuteronomy lays out that covenant relationship. If you do any research in Deuteronomy, if you have a study Bible, you no doubt will stumble on this phrase uh, that, that many scholars believe is the structure of the book. And that is, it's called a suzerain vassal treaty. Um, you can look on this on your own. I'm kind of halfway on this, but many scholars who study Near Eastern culture study what are suzerain vassal treaties. And in this day and age, a bigger king, a suzerain, would establish a relationship with lesser or smaller kings. And we have documents written during this time about their covenant agreements. And many scholars have looked at Deuteronomy and they see a correlation between the two. And I'm, I'm given to agree that there's a lot of correlation. I'm not convinced it's entirely the same, but it is interesting nonetheless. When you have a suzerain vassal, this greater king, 
would begin the treaty by reminding them of his mercy. I didn't conquer you. I let you live, and you are now mine. And the, the treaty would go on to say, these are the blessings I will give to you. If you obey me, I promise to protect you. I promise not to invade you. And then the king will end that treaty by saying, but should you disobey, these are the stipulations I will bring. I will punish you to this end. And if you look at the book of Deut- Deuteronomy, there's a lot of similarity. So some scholars argue that this book is seen as God as a supreme s- sovereign speaking to his people, establishing that treaty. Um, I think there's a lot of helpfulness, a lot of help with that. I'm not given 100% to that, but nonetheless, it does fit with the covenant renewal of the book. Uh, but God is relating to the second generation uh, covenantally. So, what is the content of the book? Let's deal with that next. The content is actually helpfully outlined because it are three distinct sections. Really, Deuteronomy is three distinct sermons or three distinct addresses that Moses gives, and that's the outline that I want to give to you. First section of the content, here's your word to hang it on, reminder. Uh, Chapters 1 through most of chapter 4 is a covenant reminder. In those chapters, Moses goes through all of the history, he breaks it down in four chapters, all of the history that Israel has experienced. He reminds them of God's deliverance from Egypt, he reminds them of their rebellion in the desert, he reminds them of what we saw last week. You refuse to go in, and therefore, for 40 years, you have wandered. It is a reminder of Israel's sin and their faithlessness. But then Moses also reminds them in those chapters of God's goodness. He reminds them of the the victories he gave over King Sihon and Og, which God gave them against all overwhelming odds. It was a reminder, if you trust God, He will give you the victory. And throughout that, Moses also reminds them of the privilege of knowing God. In fact, one of the chapters, Moses says, you are to be reminded that you and you alone were the only nation out of all the people from all of the earth that God came to. Do not forget that, Israel. You are an elect people. You have been a recipient of this amazing grace that no other people has. Do not forget. So that's your first section, chapter 1 through most of chapter 4 is covenant reminder, emphasizing the privilege uh, to be a member of the people of God. And part of the play on that is, is, is a, a warning. Moses is saying, if you disobey, it will be the same for you as your parents, but if you obey, God promises to bless you. So covenant reminder, chapters 1 through most of chapter 4. Second section is the biggest section. That is the second half of chapter 4 all the way through chapter 26. So most of, or second half of chapter 4 through chapter 26 are all about covenant requirements. Uh, Over and over, Moses now holds up the obligation of Israel to obey, the obligation to live differently because of Israel. Now, if you're taking notes, I don't want to lose anyone else, but you can actually break this into two halves. So if you're taking notes, I know this is a lot of information Bear with me, but you can divide that section to two. Chapters 4 through 11 are God's law and requirements for how to live in relationship to God. So chapter 4 to 11 are, are, are Moses, Moses is reminding Israel, this is how you relate to God in a relationship. You have there the, the Ten Commandments repeated in chapter 5. You have chapter 6, what we read this morning, where God instructs the parents to teach the children why. Because they're covenant children. God relates to them and and God wants the children not to forget and to live in relationship with God. There's numerous sections in there about idolatry and forbidding that as covenant faithlessness, but it's how to live in relationship to God. And then the, the second half of this is chapters 12 through 26, which is basically general laws for living in the promised land with God. And if you read that this week or if you read it before, you would have said, I think we've read this before. That This is probably the third or fourth time many of those laws have been repeated from Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, and now Deuteronomy. You will have requirements for having cities for people to flee to the, if they've killed someone accidentally. You're going to have all kinds of laws on festivals and feast days. You're going to have all kinds of laws on sacrifices. And you would ask, what's the point? And this is the point of that section. Moses is saying, this is what you're to do when you get in the promised land. You are to be a holy people, you're to establish a holy nation, and you are to live in the land in this way. 
So chapters 12 through 26 are structured in how to establish a holy people. And a, a number of things I want to note about this section that are by way of instruction. First of all, what we learn about the structure of, of Deuteronomy is uh, that grace always precedes law. From Genesis to Revelation, the Bible always has a structure for the gospel. Grace always precedes law. What do I mean by that? Well, grace of what God has done always precedes what He calls for us to do. If you read Paul's epistles, perhaps the book of Ephesians is the clearest example. He begins with what God has done. You've been redeemed. He's acted on your behalf. You've been saved. Now live differently. And in Deuteronomy, we see that. The first four chapters, this is what God did for you. He redeemed you. You don't deserve this. You've been rebels from the beginning. And over and over and over, what has God done to you? He's forgiven you. And once you get through chapter 4, then Moses says, in light of that grace, this is how you are to live. We learn in the book of Deuteronomy what Pastor Paul Murphy said is gospel grammar. Gospel always produces obedience. It is only grace that produces our obedience of gratitude. And so also we see in Deuteronomy, God calls His people to obey Him only after He has given them grace. And again, if you flip it the other way, you have legalism. If you begin with law before you get grace, you have legalism where you earn grace. But that is not how the gospel works. The other thing to note here about these laws that we also need to understand is these laws are meant to make Israel a blessing and a witness to the rest of the world. When you read especially chapters 12-26 to and how they're to build the nation of Israel, what God is saying is, I want you to return back to Eden. Uh, there's a sense in which Israel was to, to be a small glimpse of what we lost in the Garden of Eden. So that as Israel builds her laws on murder and, and how to care for your neighbor and all of these things, what God is trying to do is establish a witness to the watching world. This is how I want you to live. This is the way of blessing. And Israel as a people was meant to be a light unto the world by how they structured themselves. In many ways, when you read these laws, it was meant to make a society that loved God and loved neighbor. Israel was to be a place where you would want to live because peace and prosperity would come from following God's law in this way. And so the point is, the covenant requirements, the second section of the book, God is teaching His people how to live before Him in such a way as a witness to the world. So that's the second covenant requirements. Third and final section of Deuteronomy, chapters 27 through 34, is reinforcement. Covenant reinforcement. The last part of this book, those chapters, Moses gives a series of ceremonies, a series of songs, or one song, of reinforcement to remind Israel of all that he said previously in the book. You have a ceremony that's called for uh, where Israel was to get into Mount Ebal and Gerizim. This was done actually in Joshua chapter 8. These two mountains, Israel was to divide themselves and Moses lays out this repetition of song back and forth to one another of both blessing and curses. Moses says, when you get into the land, I know you're going to have a tendency to forget and so when you get in, before you finish doing anything, you're to take all of Israel to Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. You're to split the people. And he actually lays out which tribes go where. And you're to go up on this mountain. And there's to be this refrain. The people on this mountain would sing a song, and then the people on the other mountain would respond back. And this is the point. Do not forget. It is to reinforce the fact that you are to remember the blessings promised to you, but also... The curse is, should you disobey. The other big, thing, the other big element of the final chapters is Moses' song. Moses writes a song and records it at the end of the book, and that song records for Israel the, the urgency of faithfulness, the warning of forgetting. In many ways, it's his last word. And, and if I can summarize it, this, this is the point that Moses ends on. Do not forget. Don't forget your relationship with your God. So that, in a nutshell, is the content of the book of Deuteronomy. So thirdly then, the third point that we've been asking with all of these books, what do we learn now about the church? What is ultimately the application? When you read Deuteronomy, what is the, what is the application to you and I as the church? First of all, we learn that the church is in a covenant relationship with God. 
say, obviously, that's kind of the big word I've been using. That's right. We learned tonight that the church, the covenant people of God, both Old Testament and New Testament, is an established covenant relationship with God. And that's so important to remember because whenever we forget what the church is, we go immediately off course and we lose track of what we do as the people of God. Be reminded tonight, the church is not a gathering of a social club. The church is not a gathering of like-minded people who like to be around one another. Now, hopefully we like to be around one another, but the church is far more than a social gathering. It is far more than just a like-minded group of people. And, don't misunderstand me when I say this, the church is not simply a religion among others. Deuteronomy reminds you and I that the church is a gathering of people who are redeemed and have a relationship with the Almighty God. Deuteronomy holds out the blessing, the privilege, and God says, I love you. You are my people. I am the one true God. And what we do is not mere form. It's not mere action. This is a relationship that we foster with one another. And God says, don't forget that. Just like a husband and wife make vows to one another and throughout their relationship, they call one another. Don't forget, you and I are one. Deuteronomy is that from God. God says, don't forget, we have a relationship. I love you. Don't forget that. The church is a relationship. Now I want to turn to a couple passages that are important in light of this. If you have your copy of God's Word, turn to chapter 7 to see some of this. I love chapter 7. Moses' in instructing of the law reminds Israel of their relationship. You notice here, what he says about their covenant relationship is it's established by God's love. Look at chapter 7, verse 6. It says, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the people on the face of the earth to be His people, His treasured possession. Now notice, verse 7, the Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your forefathers that he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery, from the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. What is Moses saying there? Moses saying, listen, it wasn't because you were so great that God chose you. It wasn't because you were this mighty nation. No, actually, Israel, if you think about it, you were the weakest of all nations. You were the smallest among all nations. Why is it that you have a relationship with God? And the only thing Moses can say is simply one answer. Because God loved you. Notice that. We even have election language there. Who did the choosing? Did Israel come together one day and say, hey, you know what? Out of all the gods that we could serve, we're going to choose Yahweh. No. Who's the one who chose this relationship? God did. He elected Israel out of all the nations. He says, you're mine. And look at the language. God says, I love you. I love you because you are my people. I brought you near. We have a relationship, and that relationship is founded because I simply love you. You do not deserve this, but I love you. So this covenant relationship to be a member of the church is not because you and I are worthy, but simply because God loves first. The other thing we learned about the covenant relationship that we have is what we read a few moments ago in chapter 10. Turn back to chapter 10. We realize that this covenant relationship means we need to live differently. Look at chapter 10, verse 12. It says, And now, O Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and to observe the Lord's commands and decrees that I am giving you today for your own good. What's Moses saying? Because we have this relationship, God now expects you to live differently. He loved you first. He loved you when you were yet a sinner, but you cannot stay a wicked sinner. You cannot continue to live in your rebellious way. If you are loved by God, you need to live differently. You need to love God in return. You need to commit to following His ways. You need to love Him by repenting of your sin. Moses is saying that this covenant relationship comes with obligations. And you see, that is many of the lessons we're learning in our day and age in light of the church. We need to be reminded that God loves us first when we're lost in our sin, but God does not leave us in our sin. He does not affirm us in our sin. What does God do? He saves us from our sin. He redeems us. He sanctifies us. He cleans us. That's exactly what Deuteronomy reminds us. 
If you are a recipient of love, you cannot remain in your old way of living. God calls for you to live differently. Again, that's what I noted earlier, the gospel grammar. Grace must produce change in the life of those who are in a relationship with God. Uh, Here's the point. We learn from Deuteronomy that to be in the church is to be in a relationship with God, and it is grounded with vows like a marriage. Now, that has a lot of application for the covenant youth here today. If you are here and you are a baptized member of this church, do not forget you are in a relationship with God. Just like being circumcised was in the Old Testament, God claimed them as His own. If you are a baptized youth here, be reminded, you're a member of this church. And as a member of this church, you have an external relationship with this God. And the book of Deuteronomy holds out the call to you. You're to live differently. Why? Because you're in a relationship with this God. We're reminded also that as believer, you and I are to make God the center point of our life. All of our life must be lived for Him. That's the first thing we learned this evening about the church, that you will have a covenant relationship with God. Second thing we learn about the church is that we are prone to forget, or maybe to put it this way, we are warned as the church in Deuteronomy not to forget. Over and over and over, what's Moses warning Israel? Don't forget. Don't forget God's love. Don't forget the obligations. Don't forget to do what God has called you to do. Uh, We're reminded numerous times of warnings in Deuteronomy not to forget because of earthly treasures. We read that this morning from Deuteronomy 6. What was the warning to parents? When you get in these houses that you didn't build, when you benefit from vineyards you didn't plant, and everything is going well, and there's bountiful harvest and all of these things, Moses says, be careful. Because when you're living comfortable, when everything is going well, and you don't think you need God for your daily bread, it is then what you need to remind yourself. I'm dependent upon God. Don't forget, when God blesses you, do not grow comfortable. Do not love the gifts more than the giver. I mean, more than that, we're called to not forget that a relationship is not because we are righteous. You can read it on your own, but in chapter 9, specifically verses 4 through 6, the big call to not forget, Moses says there, don't forget, it's not because you're righteous that God loves you. It's not because you're better than the nations that you're going to dispossess. It's simply because God loved you. And isn't that true, believer? That's when our hearts begin to grow cold. When we begin to think, well, there's a reason why God loved me. Certainly there's a reason why I was born in a covenant family. There's a reason why. Certainly there's something different about me. The book of Deuteronomy warns the church, you're no different than the world. You're no different than than the unbelievers who don't believe. You're just as wicked as they are. What difference is there? It's not your righteousness, it's my love that makes the difference. So Deuteronomy is a reminder not to forget and not to grow cold in our relationship to God. And one of the things that we learn from that is it's why we read the law every Sunday. One of the purposes of the law is to remind us, you don't deserve God, but He loves you. The law reminds us, I'm a wicked sinner and I deserve judgment, but I'm a recipient of grace. Do not forget. And lastly, then, the last question we've been asking is what do we learn about Christ in this book? And of course, there's numerous things we could say, but just a couple to summarize. First of all, we learn that Christ is the one who bore our curse so that we could be blessed. In this book, over and over, there's curses being pronounced for disobedience, for faithlessness. And we are reminded that what sin deserves is a curse. In fact, actually, of the famous passage in chapter 21, verses 22 and 23, where God says, when someone is put to death, hang them on a tree. Why? Because if someone hangs on a tree for all the world to see, they know that person is cursed. Who also was hung on a tree? Of course, the Lord Jesus Christ. The book of Deuteronomy reminds us that because you and I have broken God's law, we've been faithless when we should have been faithful, we deserve the curses laid out in this book. And the question naturally asks, how, am I, how is that curse lifted off me? How, am I, how, am I, how is this removed so that I experience only blessing? Believer, tonight, Deuteronomy teaches you and I the only reason you are blessed is because Christ was cursed for you. Because 2,000 years ago on the cross of Calvary, God the Father forsook God the Son. He cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why? Because in the darkness of Calvary, the curses of Deuteronomy were laid upon the Son, curses that you and I deserved for all eternity. Christ was cursed so that we could be blessed. That is the wondrous grace that Deuteronomy holds out. 
by faith and repentance, by trusting, what is the mercy you've received? It is eternal life instead of eternal death. That is the gospel that Deuteronomy proclaims. The other thing we learn about Deuteronomy is that only in Christ can we have our hearts transformed. Again, if you have your Bibles open to chapter 10, look at verse 16. Notice after Moses is beginning to tell them, you've got to live differently, you must be different, you must be new, what must they do? Look at verse 16. Moses says, circumcise your hearts, therefore, and do not be stiff-necked any longer. Moses is saying, it's not going to be enough just to kind of change your own life on the outside. What needs to happen for you to be faithful? You need to be changed on the inside. Your wicked heart needs to be circumcised. Your wicked heart with sinful desires need to be put to death. And you need to literally be born again. See, to be circumcised in the heart is the Old Testament language that we learn in the New Testament is called to be born again. What Moses is telling Israel is you need to be changed from the inside out. How does one get that? One, is, one receives that grace only through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. John chapter 3, Jesus talking with Nicodemus, you must be born again. It's not about outward obedience. You can't do it. You need a new heart. Deuteronomy holds out to us the need for someone to change our hearts. That is the Lord Jesus Christ and the sending of God the Holy Spirit to do that. And we're reminded only when Christ does that, only by faith and repentance, can we be made new as Deuteronomy holds out for us. And so in many ways, Israel was preparing for the final exam of crossing over the Jordan River to enter the Promised Land. Believer tonight, in many ways, you and I are preparing for the final exam of our death. If Christ tarries, you and I will die and pass on into glory. The study of Deuteronomy is kind of like our preparation for that final exam. Do I believe? Have I repented? Am I trusting? If so, blessing abounds to those who trust in God. Amen. Let's pray. Our great God and our Heavenly Father, bless us as we study your word tonight. We thank you for the book of Deuteronomy. We thank you for its warnings. We thank you for its promises. Father, we pray that as we have heard your word tonight, we pray that God the Spirit now would write the application upon all of our hearts. And as we go from here, we pray that we would rejoice all the more knowing him. We ask this in Christ's name alone. Amen.